Hi guys, very welcome to Mentor in the another video podcast. As always, I hope you're doing absolutely fantastic. Today on the podcast, guys, we're going to be solving a few problems. Like, can a person actually pull back a transport category aircraft? Uh, why doesn't the aircraft just reverse out of the gate themselves? And what are pushback tractors? How do they work? Where do they come from? So stay tuned. Right guys, this video is brought to you in cooperation with Brilliant.org. Now, remember when you started to read when you were small and you thought it was really boring and then you found that one book that made it all interesting and after that you understood why you needed it? Well, Brilliant.org kind of helps you with that but with math and physics, okay? It's a website that is supposed to help you structure your learning in a really good way. So. Use the link below. The 501st of you who use this link is going to get 20% off the annual fee of Brilliant.org, but it's completely free to check it out. Right, guys. So, pushback tractors. Why are they there? How do they work? And why doesn't the aircraft just power back itself? Well, I have mentioned previously on the podcast why an um, aircraft with low mounted engines does not power back, why it's not recommended. Uh, but in short, if you are going to, we could potentially, even jet aircraft could potentially, you know, reverse out of gate ourselves. But there would be a huge risk of jet blasts to, you know, surrounding buildings and personnel. And in the case of low engine um, aircraft, it's very likely that we would be um, picking up gravel and, and all kinds of things from the ground and then pushing it, sucking it into the engines that could damage the engines. In the case of pushing back with high mounted uh, engines, well, you know, you had the, the problem of not really seeing what's behind you um, and associated risks with that. So that's where pushback trucks and pushback tractors come in. To know a little bit about the, uh, the history of why it's called pushback tractors uh, or tugs, um, is when you go back to the beginning of the aviation history, then the, uh, the pilots would actually just go and ask farmers around the airports if they could come with their tractors and help them pull the, um, the aircraft around. And that's why we call them tractors, even though they don't actually look like tractors at all. So, um, in the beginning of, of passenger transport, the, um, the aircraft tended to come in off the landing into the apron and we would just park close to the uh, terminal building, but not so close that we couldn't make a turn out again. So once the passengers were all on board, we would then start up our engines and we would do what's called a self-positioning turn out again. Now, this ha still happens on some smaller airports, but as the you know, uh, airline business started to, to grow and we started getting these bigger hubs near the major cities, the airports there started having problems with fitting aircrafts onto the parking, you know, enabling slots basically. So they started looking into what if we could get the aircraft to just taxi straight into the gate, park, fill up with passengers and then get some kind of vehicle to help them push out and get them taxiing again. Now since they couldn't do, since the aircraft couldn't do uh, the, the, the um, power out themselves, the power back themselves, they needed some kind of new vehicle to do this. And many companies started building these um, pushback tractors. The, the first types you, you saw, they're probably still around, or you have seen them in, in, in a lot of airports actually, are these huge square looking low vehicles, okay? They are big because they need a lot of weight. And the reason they need a lot of weight is because they need to push, you know, to have a lot of traction in order to push these huge 747 and Airbus 380s around, okay? So that's the first type. That type needed what's called a tow bar. So now a tow bar is the physical connection between the truck and the nose gear of the aircraft. And it uses the tow bar in order to leverage the nose gear to turn it. Okay, now um, every different aircraft type had a different fitting to the nose wheel, which meant that the, uh, the airport needed to have an array of different um, tow bars, or they needed a universal tow bar that needed to be adjusted for each and every aircraft, which took a lot of time. 
Okay, so this is a um, an okay solution to the uh, the pushback problem, but it's not the best. So the latest type of uh, pushback tractors that you'll see are the so-called TBLs, the toolbarless um, ones. The way they work is that they look kind of like the Batmobile. Now, if you follow me on Instagram mentor underline pilot you would have seen that i took a picture of one of those uh, not too far back if you follow me on instagram by the way guys you will be able to see pictures from my everyday uh, life so i highly recommend that you do so now these uh, batmobiles the way that they uh, work is they drive in under the aircraft okay and this by the way is why the the uh, tow truck always are low they need to fit under the nose of all the aircraft types they will be pushing but the TBLs, they use kind of like a hydraulic scope that scopes up the nose gear, lifts up the entire front of the aircraft, and by doing so, they're utilizing the weight of the aircraft itself to push down on the tires to enable traction for pushback. So, what about power in these things then? How, how powerful do they need to be? Well, once again, here's a reason why you need to, to understand about physics, because the pushback tractors are not actually that powerful, okay? They, uh, their engines range from a couple of hundred horsepower up to maybe 400 horsepower, which admittedly is a lot of power, but it's only like a sports car, all right? And thinking that they're pushing back uh, aircraft that weighs hundreds of tons, it's not that much. But what you have to understand is that these things, they utilize torque, okay? So they convert their horsepower using quite high RPMs but very low speeds through a gearbox into torque. The torque is high, okay? And this is the key to be able to, um, to push back very large and very heavy aircraft. So when we're on that subject, if, if, a, tow back, if, a, if a pushback tractor needs 250 horsepower, how come that you've seen pictures of these strongmen pulling anything from Boeing 737s up to, I think the world record is a Globemaster? Well, here you also have to understand physics, okay? And this is why I keep pushing that physics and mathematics are important because you have to understand that in order to, to get an aircraft moving, you don't really need to be able to lift the weight of the aircraft, obviously. You just need to overcome the uh, friction coefficients that the tires are, um, are getting. The friction coefficients of the tires is, is there because the tires are inflated and the weight of the aircraft kind of deforms the lower part of the tire slightly, and that creates extra friction. But they are, um, they are inflated to a very high pressure. So the friction coefficient is on a typical aircraft maybe around 0 0.006, right? So in order to calculate how much weight someone pulling an aircraft actually needs to overcome, you need to just multiply the weight of the aircraft with the, uh, the friction coefficient. So 0.006 times, let's say, around 65 tons is only around 400 kilos or so. And now you start to understand why a person can actually get an aircraft moving. The only problem is that the, air, the, 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 the person also needs to be able to overcome the friction. You know, the feet needs to be able to stay on the ground. Otherwise, he would just be, be slipping. And this is why you see these strongmen normally holding on to a, a rope or having some kind of, um, of uh, help device on the ground that gives them the extra friction needed to get that power forward and pull the aircraft. Right? Makes sense? All right, let's talk a little bit about different risk factors and the procedures surrounding pushback then. Um, you need to understand that any time that you're working with an aircraft and you're moving an aircraft, there are risks involved. There are risks in hitting um, steps, other aircraft, pushing it into traffic, things like that. And it's also a fairly significant risk to people working close to the nose gear. The nose gear is hydraulically controlled uh, via a tiller in the cockpit. We need that in order to, to steer the aircraft on the ground. I've made a video about that, by the way. Check it out. Um, so... The person that's operating the nose wheel, who's fitting the tow bar, needs to make sure that we don't start moving the nose gear because once the tow bar is connected, the tow bar will become like a bat then and hit anything in its way. And the way that that is done is via a lockout pin. So there's a small mechanism inside of the nose wheel which takes away the hydraulic pressure to the nose wheel steering. And they put that in, put the pin in, and while that is inserted, it's perfectly safe to operate um, the, the tow bar and to push the aircraft back. 
so the way that we do this, the way the procedure is done, and by the way guys, if you really want to see how this procedure is done, if you get the Mentor Aviation app and you get the collection Boeing 737 setup, dark to taxi, you will be able to see exactly how we do the whole setup and the pushback procedure in 360 video, just checking around. I will be explaining every single step, so check that out. The way that we do it is that we, the pilots, obtain clearance from air traffic control. We need to make sure that there's no one behind us, and we need to make sure that, that there's nothing else that air traffic control knows about that stops us from pushing. Once they tell us that it's okay, I will then start communicate with the pushback leader. I would make sure, using our checklist, that the aircraft is properly set up for the pushback, enable the um, transponder, for example, so that we can be seen on the ground radar. And then I will tell the um, pushback leader, who's standing outside, connected via a headset, that we are cleared for pushback. Then the pushback leader takes over control, and he tells me to release the parking brake. And it's important that he is the one who gives this command, because if I release the parking brake too early, if I'm flying a large aircraft, for example, and they're not properly connected yet, well then the aircraft could start moving and that could be very, very bad indeed. So, he or she tells me to release the parking brake and then they start the pushback procedure. I then ask him or her for um, to start the engines because they can see what's going on behind the aircraft. So this means that they can see that there's nothing in the way, like passengers boarding another aircraft, for example. I'll start the, en the engines, we push back. When the pushback is complete, they will say, set the parking brake. I will set the parking brake, and I will then tell them to, that we have two good start, disconnect the TOG, tow bar, bypass pin, advise when clear. They will do all of that, it takes a little while, down in nose wheel, uh, nose wheel bay, and then they will call me back, say, okay, everything is disconnected, great. Disconnect the headset, see you on the left or right. And not until I can clearly see the, uh, the pushback leader, who will be holding the bypass pin, with the flag normally attached, and the pushback uh, tractor, and the tow bar if that's been used. When I see all of that, then I can start reconfiguring the aircraft for starting to taxi for takeoff. It's really important that all of this has been followed to the letter to make sure that everyone involved is safe and that everyone around the aircraft is safe. So once again, SOP, standard operating procedures, are extremely important. Right guys, so that's what I wanted to talk about when it comes to TOG. There are some new TOGs coming into um, to effect as well, some robotic TOGs that can be controlled from the cockpit and also by remote control. We'll probably start to see more of those, but the, the actual pushback procedure um, is the same. It is likely though that in the future we will probably see these robots maybe pulling the aircraft into a position close to the runway so that we can weight would start in the engines, hence save a bit of fuel and save a bit of emissions, because uh, emissions and environmental factors is really, really important around the airport. Right, guys. So, before we go, I want to thank the sponsor to this episode, Brilliant.org. Now, once again, I want you to check out this link. Go and click it, you know, and, and try it out. Just take my word for it. Um, if you were like me when you were young and you didn't really like maths and physics that much, didn't really understand what's the point of it, then Brilliant.org might be the key that you need in order to see that light. Okay? There are different courses in there, they will give you different examples, they will explain everything in detail and they will really help you to, to understand the, the kind of maths and physics that you need in order to be successful in your ATPL exams and stuff later on. So, 500 first of you who checks this out, 20% off on the annual fee, but anyone can check it out for completely free. Guys, have an absolutely fantastic day wherever you are. Make sure that you keep working towards your dreams and do subscribe to this channel if you haven't already and click the little notification bell. If you haven't clicked it, you might not see when, for example, I do a live stream from the cockpit, which I did twice last week. So make sure that you've done that. Have a fantastic day. Take care of yourselves and your loved ones. And I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.